In our first lesson on the Trinity, we talked about the personhood of each member, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They're all distinct persons, but what do they have in common? What makes them a Trinity? What makes them one Godhead? Hi, I'm Yvonne Prynne from Bible 805, where you learn to know, trust, and apply the Bible. And that's what we're going to talk about today as we get into our lesson, Understanding the Trinity, Part 2, The One Substance of the Trinity. Now, this lesson is part of a series on the Trinity. Lesson number one was Understanding the Trinity, the Three Persons of the Trinity. How the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are uncreated, co-equal, and eternal persons. The second part, and that's what we're talking about now, we're going to talk about the substance of the Trinity, the attributes that are shared by the members of the Trinity, and what that means to us. And then the third part that's coming is the Trinity throughout the Bible, where I'll share with you descriptions of the Trinity and the roles of each member in the Old and New Testament. I think you, well, all of this, all of these lessons on the Trinity, I think can be kind of surprising if you haven't studied it before. But I think you'll find that one particularly interesting, some of the things on it. But let's get into our current lesson. And let me just say before I start that notes, videos, podcasts, podcasts, charts, all sorts of things associated with this series on the Trinity are available for you at www.bible805.com. Please check that out because although I describe all of the things, if you're just listening to this on the podcast, some of the charts I think you'll find very helpful. But let's jump in now and As a reminder, remember Tertullian was an early church father, an early leader. He was a Roman lawyer, and he's the person who came up with the term Trinity, and he defined it as una substantia tres personae, meaning God is one substance in three persons. In the previous lesson, we looked at the meaning of personhood and how each member of the Trinity is a person, not a force, not an influence, totally and truly a person and how the three persons of the Trinity relate to each other. In this lesson, we're going to look at the characteristics, the substance or attributes each one has in common with the other two. We're going to look at verses that support the attribute and then at the implications and applications of that attribute to us. So the first one we're going to look at is God's holiness. John MacArthur has a good definition of holiness where he says the word holiness refers to his separateness, his otherness, the fact that he is unlike any other being. It indicates his complete and infinite perfection. 1 Samuel 2 2 says, there is none holy like the Lord, there is none beside you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, Revelation 4, 8 tells us. Isaiah 6, 3 says, And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And Exodus fifteen eleven says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? In addition to God's holiness, he is a just God. This goes along with his holiness. As God is set apart, he is totally different also in that apartness, in that he is just in a perfect degree. The word just comes from the Hebrew word sadak, which means lawful and righteous. In Deuteronomy 32.4, it says, The rock, his work is perfect for all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Nehemiah 9.3 says, For thou art just in all that is brought upon us, for thou hast done right, but we have done wickedly. Now these two characteristics I've listed first because we need to look at them to help us understand who we are in our relationship to God. He is our creator and humanity has sinned against him. Sin is defined as missing the mark. Well, 
what is the mark that we've missed? The mark we're missing is God's holiness. We do not measure up to his standard of holiness. That is the definition of sin. And we need to realize that this is extremely serious and we are are separated from God by a huge gap. Now, I've given, I've also created, in addition to talking about the bad news, how separated we are from God, the good news is, of course, that Jesus formed a bridge by his death on the cross between us and our holy God. And I put together a chart for you on that that illustrates the plan of salvation. And again, that's on Bible805.com. I don't want to go over the whole chart now, but it just illustrates very clearly how we are separated from our God because of his holiness and our sin. Let's look a little bit more at what this means to us. God is our creator, sustainer, king, and judge, and he has the right and the power to set the rules. We violated them and are justly condemned to an eternity apart from him. But by his grace, he sent Jesus to die on the cross to save us. And when we accept him as Savior, he gives us God's very life in us, so that instead of his holiness being something that separates us, this is really neat, listen carefully, It can become, instead of a reason for condemnation, it can actually become a characteristic of our lives. Holiness, again, from a source of condemnation to a call for us to participate in it. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. First Thessalonians 4, 7 says, For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. First Peter 2, 9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And since we have a hard time doing this, the next characteristic is very important, and that is that our God is merciful. Psalm 145, 8 and 9 says, Jehovah is kind and merciful, slow to get angry, full of love. He's good to everyone, and his compassion is intertwined with everything he does. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. And Lamentations 3, 19 through 22 says, Oh, remember the bitterness and suffering you've dealt to me, for I can never forget these awful years. Always my soul will live in utter shame. Yet there is one ray of hope. His compassion never ends. It is only the Lord's mercies that have kept us from complete destruction. And we are to be like him in this also. Matthew 9.13 says, But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And James 2.12 and 13 says, You will be judged on whether or not you're doing what Christ wants you to do. So watch out what you do. So watch what you do and what you think. For there will be no mercy to those who have shown no mercy. But if you've been merciful, then God's mercy toward you will win out over his judgment against you. In Micah 6, 8, He's shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. Mercy is also often translated kindness. And I, I really like that because I think we have more of an idea of what it means to be kind. So mercy or kindness, that's how we ought to live. Now we ought to, as an application, always come down on the side of kindness and mercy. We're so easy to take offense. And we shouldn't assume a negative always about others. Now, why is it we never assume good things? Oh, they did this because they didn't like us. No, you know, we don't just assume good stuff, which we should. I got some great advice some years ago when someone said, 
I don't know why I do what I do, so how can I assume to judge why another person does what they do? That's really good to remember. And remember also that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Don't do his job. We can critique or challenge actions. And we're supposed to do that to lovingly help one another. But we can never ascribe motives or label a person because of just one action. Finally, simply be merciful, be kind. Now, moving along in God's characteristics, the next one that follows very naturally is, of course, love. Psalm 36, 5 through 7, your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. How precious is your unfailing love, O God. All humanity finds shelter in the shadow of your wings. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And 1 John 4, 7 and 8, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Now what this means for us, in 1 Corinthians 13, a really neat way to apply this is to put in God for the word love. The passage we just read says that God is love, so It follows that all that love is describes what God is to us. In 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about how how love is patient, kind, etc., and all that. Just substitute the word God for the word love. God is patient. God is kind. God does not dishonor others. God is not easily angered. God keeps no record of wrongs. God does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. God always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. God never fails. Like many of God's attributes, it's difficult to truly understand God's love. Paul, the Apostle Paul, prayed for his people that they might be able to understand it when he said in Ephesians 3.17, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power, together with all God's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. We need to pray for that understanding. I know that many times I doubt and I don't understand God's love, and I think many of our questions and our fears would be solved if we truly understood the depths of God's love to us. The next characteristic is truth. 1 John 5.20 says, We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. Numbers 23.19, God is not a man that He should lie or the Son of Man that He should change His mind. Has He said and will He not do it? Or has He spoken and will He not fulfill it? And John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now in contrast, and this is important, Satan is the father of lies. John 8.44 says, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was talking to the Pharisees. He was a murderer, speaking of Satan, from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. This is why untruth in any form, a white lie, an exaggeration, a, oh, I just forgot to do this, a whatever, Untruth in any form is so horrible for a Christian. Whenever we are not honest, we reflect the enemy, not our Lord. 
Now let me give you a few quick notes on Satan because there's a lot of confusion concerning him. And this is a good time to talk about it when we talk about these characteristics of God because Satan does not, does not share any of the characteristics we are talking about with God. He is a created being. He is not equal in any way to God. He is also just one being. He is not everywhere, though he has an army of fallen angels. Most likely, realistically, Satan himself probably doesn't care at all about what you personally are doing. He probably has much bigger uh, victims or whatever that he's focused on. His demons are out and about causing problems, but you need to be very careful that you don't attribute everything to Satan. He is also not all-knowing. He cannot read your thoughts. He has no idea of your future. I heard a, a, a talk recently at a church, and this is wrong, where the person speaking said, well, Satan knows that all this is going to happen to you and that great things are coming, and so he wants to distract you, or he knows that you're going to have success in this area, and so he wants to put all these obstacles in your way. No, 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 no. Satan is not omniscient. He does not know the future. He does not know these things. Now, that's not to say that he can't mess with you, but you cannot attribute to him more power than what he has. Also, he is not the cause of every trouble and misfortune in your life. And by the way, neither is God. God is merciful and protects us from many things. But we have to remember in John 1, 13 and 14, where God reminds us, where James reminds us, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Well, how do we know what is the source of our problems when they come? Very simple, know the Bible. Know how God wants you to live. It's very different than the standards of our world today, and sadly, much of what you hear, even from many Christian sources. So ask for wisdom when you're confused as to the source of your trials or what you should do. Ask for strength, for wisdom, to help you do what you need to do to know exactly what you shouldn't do. Ask others for their prayers and help. Sometimes people can give you really good insight when you're just maybe too close to a problem or whatever. And then some of the best advice, when Joshua's, when the people that Joshua was leading sinned, he was crying out to the Lord and there's a place for that. But then there's also a time where we need to heed what God said to Joshua when he said, get up off your face and do what needs to be done. That's oftentimes the best advice that we can take. Just get up off our face, get to work, deal with the issue, vow to trust God, at least try, take the steps you need to take, do whatever you need to do to follow God more closely. Our next characteristic, God is all-knowing, he's omniscient. In Psalm 139, 1 through 6, we have this wonderful passage where it says, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Isaiah forty twenty eight. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. Now what this means to us, he knows all about us, and yet he understands and he still loves us. He doesn't get tired of us, tired of dealing with us. It's a wonderful example for us to follow because so often we might say or think, oh, if you really knew that person, you wouldn't see, think they were so great or whatever. That's outside of the fact that that's really mean. God already does know them. He knows more rotten stuff about them than you can even imagine. And yet he still loves and accepts them. Also, we might get tired of someone we love messing up again and again and again, but God does not give up on them. 
And we cannot, we should not, we pray, we need to pray for the ability to not do less, but to be as loving and kind and merciful as we can, no matter what we know or don't know about people. God is also everywhere. He's omnipresent. Jeremiah twenty three twenty four. Who can hide in the secret places so that I cannot see them, declares the Lord. Do I not feel heaven and earth, declares the Lord? Proverbs fifteen three. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. 1 Kings eight twenty seven. But will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house which I have built. This was part of Solomon's prayer when he built the temple. Acts seventeen twenty four. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he does not dwell in temples made with hands. Now, combining his love and his omnipresence, here are a couple of verses that have been really meaningful to me. In Romans 8.38, it says, I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't. Life can't. The angels won't, and all the powers of hell itself cannot keep God's love away. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, or where we are, high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing will ever be able to separate us from the love of God. Just a personal note on this, when I traveled and taught seminars all over, I was flying quite quite a bit. I did that for 20 years. But the whole time that I did that, I never got over being absolutely terrified of flying. I get violently ill when I fly. I have to take a lot of medication. I have this inner ear issue or whatever. And I'm also just a nervous wreck and just all sorts of things. But this verse helped me so much. And I would focus on it. I'd actually had it written on a card and a number of other verses that I would always look at when I would get on the plane and remind myself of no matter where I was, as it says, high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing separated me from God's love. And nothing, no matter where you are, will separate you from God's love right now. He's also all-powerful. He's omnipotent. Ah, Sovereign Lord, you've made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you, Jeremiah said. The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command, Hebrews 1.3. Now what this means to us, we need to recognize, this is a little bit of a reality check, these are wonderful, glorious verses, and I hope your heart was encouraged as you read them or heard them, but also we need to remember that just because God can do all things doesn't mean he will do them or do them in the ways we think are best or, and this is always the challenging thing for me, do them in the timing that we want. Remember, God is the one who sees the big picture, how we're to grow, how we're to influence others, why we need to go through certain trials for our good and his glory. I have a chart, again, another chart, lots of charts, hopefully to help illustrate this, on God's view of time, where he sees it all. And we need to keep that in mind at our little point in time so that we don't get discouraged or upset. But in all of that, we need to also remember that someday all will be well. I have a printable on this to remind you of it. Uh, Again, the links for both of these are on Bible 805. But Julian of Norwich uh, gave us this wonderful quote where she said, All will be well. All will be well. All manner of things will be well. She lived through the pandemic of the 14th century, and she felt that God gave her this promise. And we need to just trust God's love and wisdom until then. God is also immutable and unchangeable. Malachi 3, six says, I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Psalm 33.11 says, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Psalm 102.27 says, But you are the same, and your years will have no end. Now, what does this mean to us? Nothing we can do can change how he feels about us 
or his promises to us. And on the other side, his expectations, his commands, his justice, because he's unchangeable. They don't change. They are timeless also. And in a very practical way, we need to learn the applications of his word for today by learning their true meaning in the past. That's why we study hermeneutics, which is how to interpret the Bible, and we're going to be having some studies on that. So be looking for that with Bible 805. Our God is also eternal. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory for ever and ever. Amen. Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? And finally, in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now what this means to us, no, we can't really conceive of what this means. Listed last on this, the whole, the characteristics of eternality is listed last on this chart to remind us that all the extraordinary previously mentioned attributes of our God will never end. And he shares them with us. Remember in 1 John 5, 11 and 12, it says, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. That makes all God is personal and unlike human emotions. God's understanding, love, and mercy to us will never end. And for that, we can be eternally grateful. Final application, strive to be like your God. We cannot imitate the omni characteristics, the omnipotence and all those sorts of things, but there are many characteristics that we can and are commanded to imitate. The WWJD, what would Jesus do, is not just a saying, but an excellent question to ask ourselves continuously as we think about the character of our God. Remember the number one goal of a disciple, and we are to be Jesus' disciples, by its very definition, is to become like the one we follow. We should always, and in every way, strive to become like our God, like Jesus. It is an overwhelming goal, but let's try to do our best to do justly, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God.